and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Welcome to this new series. Coming up, we get all the news and top selling games from May 1989. I get printing. I review some games. Have a chat to Jeff. And end with some remakes. But first, here's the news. Crash, the most popular Spectrum magazine, has gone through an amazing shrinking process, reducing its pages down from 90 to 35. The contents remain much the same, with previews, reviews and hints. But with just over two-thirds less content, is this a sign of things to come? Yet another budget label is about to be launched on the public, supplying those old games that many of us fondly remember, but don't really want to buy again. Winner is the name of the label, whose sister venture Alternative already put out similar content. There seems no reason why a company should create yet another cheap price outlet for older games, other than for some kind of tax dodge or business skullduggery. Either way, the first game to appear on this label will be War, originally released by Martech. Micronet, the new online experience for micro-users, has extended its content to include a few new features. There's a news section, containing news, obviously, from around the world, a sports section, a lifestyle section, and finally something more interesting to us Spectrum users, a games area. This is said to provide state-of-the-art electronic entertainment, whatever that means. It also includes a brilliant online adventure game called Shades. So this section is definitely worth a visit for owners of the VTX 5000 modem or equivalent. A new association has been set up with the aim of improving games. The ESPA, or to give them their full title, the Entertainment Software Publishers Association, will allow software companies to get together and pool their knowledge to improve the software through market research. Yes, it's all a smokescreen to gather your data and sell it on at huge costs, while you, the honest gamer, taken in by this claptrap, think that they're actually going to make games better. A new light gun has been released for the Spectrum by Trojan. The Magnum light phaser will be compatible with various models of the Spectrum and come supplied with a games bundle. However, the news item that I took this from referred to it as the Sinclair Magnum light gun, but both guns are exactly the same. Software companies such as US Gold, Demark and Ocean have all said they're writing software that will support the device. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. At number 5 is Dragon Ninja from Imagine. At number 4, Operation Wolf from Ocean. At number 3, WEC Le Mans from Imagine. At number 2, Emlyn Hughes International Soccer from Audiogenic. And at number 1, Robocop from Ocean. And that was the news and top selling games from May 1989. Despite being pushed as an educational and even small business computer, the Spectrum had little in the way of connectivity. There was no network port, no monitor output, no serial port and no parallel port. This left users who wanted to use their micros for something other than games a little frustrated. Sinclair tried to rectify this in two ways. Firstly, the ZX printer, a tiny bog roll printer device that melted holes in 4 inch wide paper coated in aluminium. And later Interface 1 that had a serial port, although the connections were not standard. Other hobbyist printers arrived in the form of the Alphacom 32 printer and the less popular Floyd 40, but for the professional there was little choice. Eventually companies saw a gap in the market and started making parallel interfaces for the machine, providing Centronics compatible printing. There were several on the market including the Ramwright, the L-Print, Tasman and Daytel Interprinter, and hopefully I'll be checking some of these out in later episodes. Most businesses would buy an Epson printer, almost the standard for printing in those days, with control codes that were adopted by all other manufacturers, even the ones making interfaces for the Spectrum. Printers though were expensive, costing more than the Spectrum itself, until the late 80s when cheaper models started to appear. The Star LC-10, the Citizen 120D, and the Canon BJ-10 bubble jet spring to mind. 
But back to the Spectrum then, and let's take a look at one of these devices, the Kempston Centronics Parallel Interface. Retailing at £45 when it was released meant that this, coupled with a printer, would set you back somewhere in the region of £200. That's more than the Spectrum. Obviously, to try it out, I will need a suitable printer, and a quick trawl on eBay found me a Citizen Swift 9, a 9-pin dot matrix printer that just needed a new ribbon. The interface has many options and settings, some specific to particular printers, but let's plug it in and have a go. The main functionality is text only, but there is an option for high res mode. In text mode, the standard Sinclair commands like Llist, Lprint and Copy will all work, so let's have a go. Printing some text direct from a listing is easy, using the Lprint command. And the printer works as you would expect. Ah, those familiar 9-pin printing sounds. Printing out the listing with Llist again works perfectly. Now let's try the screen dump. And yes, again, using the copy command we get an ink-only screen dump. All of the ink colours are represented as black and the paper as white. I tried to use the printer on The Hobbit, because that allowed output to the ZX printer, but this failed to work. I suspect the program had not detected a printer connected, and so disallows printing. As with many printers of this era, the Citizen is controlled using escape codes. The Spectrum does not have this option though, so the interface has to be set for individual things like printing italic and bold, if you want it to. Some of these codes are explained in the small manual, but not all of them. For example, it tells you how to use escape E for bold, but it fails to tell you how to turn it off. I had to look up Epson escape codes to find out myself. The character 27 command informs the printer that the next code is going to be an escape code, and there are a number of these you can use. Most printers have a variety of escape codes for things like italic, double size print, double width print and different fonts. My printer had four built-in fonts, and these could be changed on the front panel. This meant it was easy to switch between draft printing and near letter quality printing, and the output was quite impressive too. The interface works with task word 2, but does need some extra steps. First you need to turn off tokens, this is to stop the printer printing out Sinclair keywords. You then load task word, and once into it you go to the printer settings and enter the options according to the manual. And you should be ready to go. The interface works well and lets you use normal printers on your spectrum, although finding a printer with a parallel port these days is becoming harder. There are options for different widths of printing, from 80 to 164 characters per line, so you can get a professional look if you need to. The setup codes are a bit of a pain, but the end results are very nice, and I was surprised how quickly I got used to them. If you could afford a printer and the interface, then you'd be very pleased with the results, especially if you owned a small business. And if your printer supported the Epson control codes, you'd have even more scope. Overall, then a nice interface, Slightly expensive when coupled with a printer, but for someone looking to use their machine for other things than games, a good choice. <laughs> Golden Axe was an arcade game released in 1989 by Sega. Taking the role of one of three characters, the player had to battle their way from left to right across a scrolling landscape to take vengeance on the evil Death Adder. Each character had a different weapon and a different magic spell, which was basically a smart bomb. The game in the arcades was great, looking excellent with good sounds and addictive gameplay. The Spectrum version was released in 1990 by Virgin Games and attempted to include most of the arcade features. Once you've chosen the character you want to play, accompanied by some nice music, and defining the controls, it's on to the game. This is a two-player game too, but you can play alone. The first thing that strikes you are the graphics. With clever use of the Spectrum's limitations, the graphics look really colourful and are easily recognisable. 
They do move in jumps though, but this allows for the use of coloured sprites. The fighting moves are close to the arcade too, but obviously less smooth and with less frames of animation. But in fairness, the authors have done a brilliant job here. Each enemy takes a few hits to get rid of them, and then it's on to the next wave. Early in the game you come across an enemy mounted on a weird beast, and good players can knock him off and then jump on themselves, and this gives you more damage, and makes taking out the bad guys a bit easier. In between some of the waves are small dwarfs, and kicking these will drop spells. Collecting these will build up your smart bombs. As you progress, the enemies get larger and more difficult to beat. And the difficulty, I think, is the same as the arcade machine. Golden Axe is a multi-load game with each level loading in and changing the background. And these backgrounds are quite detailed too, and very nice to look at. The graphics are excellent and really show off the spectrum. The characters have large masks behind them, which is quite obvious when they move in front of the coloured background, but it doesn't detract, and you're usually too busy trying to stay alive anyway. Sound is okay with a swoosh for your attack and a ping sound when you collect things, and more white noise when fighting, but not the best use of the sound chip, but still not bad at all. Overall this is a great game, easy to play but difficult to beat, but you'll have great fun trying. This is The Birds and the Bees, released by Bugbyte Software in 1983. This early game was heavily advertised as having graphics done by Matthew Smith, the author of Manic Minor although it is rumoured that he did not actually create them, but instead that they were influenced by him. Either way, it produced a lot of interest in the game solely because of Matthew's supposed involvement. Controlling Boris the Bee, you have to set out and collect pollen from the various flowers across a horizontally scrolling landscape. In your way are various enemies including large birds, aeroplanes, and in later levels, caterpillars. The control is tricky. It involves keeping Boris flying by continually stabbing the up key while using the left and right to change direction. This often means your bee floats out of control due to the inertia involved. And this is the game's challenge. If the control was fixed to a stop-start movement, the game would be much easier and rather dull. Once you locate a flower, flying into it will cause Boris to grab the pollen, and this fills up the pollen meter at the bottom of the screen. You need six flowers to completely fill it. Once full, you return back to the hive, again avoiding the enemies, and carrying pollen means that Boris moves a bit slower and is even trickier to control. The graphics, as you can see, do look like Matthew had some involvement, and are well drawn and well animated. The sound is used well, with a nice tune on the intro screen, and various spot effects throughout the game, and a constant ticking sound that represents Boris's wings. The control takes a while to get to grips with, but even when you get it right, the flying enemies are still sometimes difficult to avoid, often following you and changing direction. You do have a defender like radar at the bottom of the screen, which helps you to avoid colliding with enemies that you're about to meet, but as the levels progress, they get even more aggressive.
A tricky little game then, that's worth a play, but by modern standards it does look a bit dated. Still, good fun for a while though. This is Robot Rumble, released in 2018 by Miguatello. This clever little game was written using Arcade Games Designer, but steers clear of the usual platform games produced by this excellent tool. Instead we get an addictive platform puzzler. You have to guide your robot down the screens, eventually taking them to their demise into a pit of lava. And the only way you can do this is to use the large magnets at each side of the screen to drag your robot left and right. If it reaches the end of a platform it will fall down, however there are things there that it shouldn't really touch that will kill it, so you have to choose the best route. When the magnet lines up with a little robot it is attracted to it and it will move, and using this mechanic you have to guide them down all of the platforms to the bottom and onto the next screen. The magnets have a limited charge too, so you can't hang around. Later levels promise glass floors, lifts and teleports, so there's a lot to contend with if you want to complete this game. The graphics are well drawn and everything runs smoothly as you would expect from an AGD game. Sound is used well with 1 to 8k machines having some really nice music during the game. Overall then, a nice little game this, well designed and something you should have a go at. So this is uh, a request from one of my Patreons who wants us to discuss the game or games I would like to most see updated for the Spectrum next. Go on then, you kick off. For me, it would probably be 3D driving game of some description because the Spectrum really struggled with that sort of thing. Outrun, for example, was awful. The frame rate was about one frame a second and, and pole position was awful. And hard driving was awful because... The Spectrum just didn't have the processing power to do it, do the graphics properly. So I think the next updating games to that would would produce a really good game for a start. Yeah, I think so. Totally agree. Because when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about games that the Spectrum wasn't powerful enough to do. So Outrun was definitely one. Yeah. And actually, if you think about the next and the hardware in it and being able to read from the SD card as well, any multi-load game. There's a lot of those that, that you always have to wait for the next level to load. Yeah. Which... Gauntlet 3 just springs to mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Golden Axe as well, I've just reviewed Golden Axe and that's multi-level, uh, multi-load. So Is it? That, yeah. And uh, actually, talking of Golden Axe, another other games that would be improved with things like hardware scrolling, so all of your scrolling shoot 'em ups should get better hardware scrolling and Golden Axe would, would have hardware scrolling instead of push and Midnight Resistance would out, could also have proper um, pixel scrolling instead of push scrolling. Yeah. So what what about you? Have you got a different idea of what, what games? Well, I, I did think of games that I just thought the Spectrum wasn't quite powerful in, enough to do. So, yeah, anything multi-load. Bard's Tale. You know I like RPGs. Bard's Tale would be gr brilliant. I don't think I would want to see any of the games that were really good on the Spectrum redone. No. So, I mean, any of my like top 10, 20 or 30 even, I, I think I'd... I'd shy away from them, although Bard's Tale was number 11 in my top 100s. 
but, but but games like those you could improve the the graphics for the locations and you could you could massively increase their size because of uh, memory and SD card. Yeah, but so, so, sometimes I've I've seen that done where games have been made absolutely huge before they've they've been increased. I'm, I don't necessarily think it adds to them. Sometimes it can take away. There's just too much. Right. Uh, make it can make games too hard. So go on then. Give me a game that you would think. Could, would get a good makeover for the Spectrum um, next. Swords and Sorcery was the one I thought of. Oh, um, by a PSS. Yeah. That that three uh, it was three D wireframe, wasn't it? Um, it wasn't wireframe. It was it, it was kind of bards tilly. It scrolled actually. It's interesting. It scrolled as you walked. It scrolled as you. I mean, it only had an absolutely tiny viewing kind of frame. Yeah. So it was it was probably quite easy to do the the scrolling in that because it was it was quite small. But even that you could get bigger or a bit more detailed or something like that. But I really liked and enjoyed, but felt a bit flawed and like it kind of could have been done better. Would be really really good mm. rather than make remaking the classics. No point remaking Night Law really because you can't get better than Night Law than Night Law is. Or yeah, uh, and the same and, and I think the same with Manic Miner. I, I played the updated version on the Sam. Mm. when I covered the Sam, and it was the same game, but somehow it just didn't have that same feeling about it because it didn't have the Spectrum graphics. Yeah. Now, there is a version of Rex being done, isn't there? Rex, the next new mission or something like that. Now, I loved Rex. And and the thing is, while I wouldn't want to see Rex remade, this isn't a remake, this is a follow-up. Right. And it's, it's got extra things in it. Um, I think it's got a jetpack, actually. That was a whole separate thing, sequels to games. So you, you could have a sequel to Night Law, uh, on the spectrum, you could have a sequel to um, Outrun. Not Outrun. You really want a proper version of that, but you know what I mean. G- yeah. Games that were good on the spectrum, like Rex, you could have a sequel in it, and it wouldn't be just taking the game and putting fancy graphics on it. Yeah, yeah. Because the question was updated, wasn't it? It wasn't what would you like to see remade. It was updated for the next. So sequels. I think sequels to good games and remakes of games where the, the hardware str- struggled really. What about sports games? What about things like Match Day and things like that? Given the power of the next and where it is, it would be good to have a kind of, you know, the the, the top-down football games. If you're talking about a football game, something oh, yeah. like sensible soccer or yeah. kickoff. Or kickoff, yeah. Yeah. I think they could work well on the next. Um, yeah, because, again, I'm sorry to hark on about it, but hardware scrolling <laughs> will make that a lot better. <laughs> and, and the lack of colour clash, which means you, you're going to be able to see things when you get a lot of things on get together on the yeah. screen. Some of the games that never got made... My the, proper, the, the proper Scooby Doo. My Amer. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so for me, that's it. That there's the things that I'd like to see updated for the yeah. next. I agree. I I thought we were going to uh, disagree on this, but it sounds like we're pretty pretty much aligned on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Back in the early days, most of the Spectrum games released were arcade clones, and this one is no different. And I think the name gives it away. Yes, this is Microgen's version of the arcade classic Scramble. The arcade game had smooth scrolling landscapes and a very distinctive sound. This version though, does a decent job, considering it was an early release, and that the Spectrum does not have hardware scrolling. The aim of a game, in case you didn't know, was to get as far as you can, shooting or dodging missiles, bombing fuel dumps to keep your fuel level up, and avoiding the landscape. Early Microgen games had their own distinctive sounds, and this one is no different, offering a range of zaps and sirens as you play. The control differs from the arcade version, in that you press right to move right, but when you release the key, the ship moves back on its own. There's no key for dropping bombs either. The game automatically does this for you, so it's something you don't have to think about. But again, it's different from the arcade, and takes away some of the gameplay. A decent effort for an early game, and one that's 16k. And although it's not one of the best versions, it does a good job to warrant a try. You can see my full scramble shootout in episode 22.
there was an explosion of remakes back in the early 2000s, with old 8-bit games getting a makeover by fans of the original. People used tools such as Blitz Basic, Dark Basic and Click and Create, and good old-fashioned coding to bring new life into these old classics. There are a lot of them about if you can track them down, so I thought, to give you a start, I would show you some of the games that I wrote. All of my games can be downloaded free from my website, and the first one is R. Didums, a remake of the Imagine game. You control a teddy bear that has to collect bricks to build steps to move to the next toy box. I updated the graphics and sound and made a few small tweaks. There's also a secret message screen if you get far enough into the game. And for a bit of fun I replaced one of the objects with a spectrum. Next is Booty. This Firebird classic gets a full makeover here. It has the same game map, the same enemy movements and the same gameplay. The graphics have obviously been tweaked a bit, along with the sound. You can find the development diary for this game in the Spectrum Show magazine issue 6. And finally we have Scumball, another budget game remake. Again, the graphics and sound have been updated, but the game map and gameplay is about 95% accurate. I say 95% because I couldn't find a use for some of the items in the game, so I didn't include them. There are many more remakes of Spectrum games to seek out. Some are really excellent too. If you want to play a few, you'll have to go looking for them, and I recommend starting at the Retrospect website. However, there are other remake sites scattered about the internet, and it's a shame that some of the main ones have closed down now. If anyone can recommend another site or remake, post it in the comments. <laughs> 